Hello and welcome to another edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. There are few debates that are as contentious as those that touch on the core. Matters of life and death are profoundly personal, to say the least. The government in Ottawa has managed to secure a further three-year delay in access to medical assistance in dying for those suffering from mental illness alone, as opposed to those with a physical malady such as, say, cancer. And then there's the issue of advanced requests, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And we're going to Jocelyn Downey. She's the James S. Palmer Chair in Public Policy and Law at the Schulich School of Law, member of the Royal Society of Canada, selected as a Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy. Uh, she is an expert in end-of-life law policy and care, part of the legal team uh, in the Carter decision that was so key in 2015. And for those of you who don't know, we'll explain that in a few moments as we uh, get into this discussion. The reason I reached out to Jocelyn today is because she was also a witness at the Joint Parliamentary Committee, of which I am a part and which said we were ready to proceed with this, um, even though that's not really how it was portrayed. So, Dr. Downey, thank you very much for being uh, with us today. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. So let me just start, and, and of course I come to this with a political perspective. The first thing the government said about this whole issue and the delay of three years is they wanted to delay it until after the next election. And I guess that's how I reacted and why I reacted, that this wasn't even about readiness from the get-go. It seemed to be about politics, an issue that they didn't want to have to talk about in campaigns. What's your sense of that? Well, unfortunately, sitting outside, it certainly looks like that because why I say that is that there are no reasonable justifications for it. And so if you look at all the justifications that get proposed and none of them make any sense at all, all you're left with is the one that makes sense, which is political expediency. Yeah. Well, um, that is all I can conclude as well. We sat there and, and this committee has been underway for many years. It was reconvened quickly in October. And it was clear from the get-go that the government had decided at that moment that they wanted a delay. Uh, and so witnesses were called. But what happened is that 15 of the 21 witnesses and people like you who are experts actually said, we are ready. Um, of course, there's never enough doctors or nurses or health professionals to do anything in this country, including cancer surgery or, or name what the issue might be, but that there was enough people ready, willing, and able. The rules were in place. The standards were in place. Can, can you just <laughs> talk about that a bit? You were one of the people that said, yeah, we are ready. Yes, because people took very seriously last year when a one-year delay was given. They looked at what the metrics were, the reasons given for why why they weren't ready last year. Seemed to be there were four major metrics, and everybody set to and got them done. And yeah. so it was startling when everything had been done. The witnesses were able to tell and demonstrate that everything had been done. And yet still the committee came back saying there isn't readiness, and then the government uh, piled on and said there isn't readiness. And then the pr provincial territorial ministers appeared with a letter uh, saying they weren't ready. <laughs> yeah, that was that was that was shocking. That also made the political expediency piece yeah. just so much more obvious, because when do they do that? And why do they do that? Yeah, it was pretty obvious. Um, so what was what was quite shocking to me about the, the process in terms of those witnesses was the uh, the way in which the committee decided it was going to keep evidence from itself. There was <laughs> evidence that was available, it was submitted, it was from the very people who had been doing the readiness preparations to be able to explain to them, this is what was done with the practice standard, this is what was done with the curriculum and so on, and they chose not to receive that, that, that evidence. And to me, how do you as legislators, yeah as responsible individuals needing to make a decision about something like this, make a recommendation uh, to the House and the Senate, keep evidence from yourself in order yeah. to 
get to a result uh, that you wanted to get to. We, we could read it and, and people did read it <laughs> and it was available and we heard um, and we heard you and others actually speak it aloud. So the, the other thing that isn't reported, and I guess this is part of the problem we've got with media and politics today, is that there is actually no memory. It's like mm -hmm. the world started today and then tomorrow the world will start again tomorrow. There's no right. context or history uh, for this. But there were minority reports. There were dissenting reports attached to this. And again, sort of... Um, as if that didn't mean anything. Part of the dissenting report that I put my name to included a longtime psychiatrist and two practicing doctors. Uh, these are people that actually know the issues. Um, there was constitutional concerns. So let's just let, let's just deal with the issue of the medical profession being ready. Um, okay. I, and because what we heard, the argument we heard from the from the government in the Senate was that unless everybody can have access to this, nobody can have access to this. And I can't imagine, especially growing up in in a rural part of Saskatchewan where, you know, you drive three hours to get your toe looked at, never mind cancer surgery. Um, and that that in no other field of medicine is that a rule, only this one. Absolutely. And and it was baffling to hear that said because nobody has the, 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 not everybody is ready and available for made at all. Right. Not everybody is, as you say, ready and available for any kind of health intervention. So if that is the reason for saying you can't have access to MAID for mental disorders, then nobody should have access to any MAID. And in fact, nobody should have access to any kind of healthcare because that's not a standard that is met by healthcare in Canada. The other piece I would add to that is that it was, it was a bit of a, it was a sl slippery as a, a pejorative term, but an, an illegitimate move to go from there aren't enough clinicians to people getting unsafe access. Yeah. What it, yeah. what you do is if you don't have enough clinicians, you don't get access. That you don't get unsafe exactly. access. And so that is just an invalid argument that they were making in relation to the availability of uh, clinicians. The way the Canadian healthcare system deals with that is something called a waiting list, which we have for every other procedure. Yeah. In, in the world, and that is what would happen if there are not enough providers or people. We, we, are, we already have that with the track two. So patients whose natural death is not yet reasonably foreseeable, but people who are not excluded, there are wait lists yeah. in many parts of the country for medical assistance and dying for them because there aren't enough clinicians. So it makes no sense. And that's what surfaces the discriminatory nature of what's been done. It is only when it is people with mental disorders that you run that argument. Well, then that's that's really disturbingly discriminatory. The other thing that was confusing, and of course, we didn't hear any testimony directly from those with mental disorders, with which is also a big problem, but it was conflated with the disability community. And when you talk to people in the mental health or mental illness community, they say, we're not in that, that that's not our group. We're a, a, a standalone group here. The issues are different. Is, is that fair? And it, it's absolutely fair that they got conflated, that the exclusion of people with mental disorders as their sole underlying condition got conflated with all of track two, which is which includes people with disabilities. Um, and what was going on was advocacy to try and roll back access to all of track two. Yeah. And so they hung their hat on the only thing in front of parliament at the moment was this issue of do we get another delay on mental disorders? Uh, so that's where it seemed like the argument was happening. But the, the arguments were all about track two. They were all about that we should not have this, this, this track, this kind of, this group be available, be yeah. accessible, able to access made. And they're just relitigating, uh, the Truchon case, which was a case out of Quebec, which said, 
you have to allow people whose natural death is not yet reasonably foreseeable to have access. Indeed, the two plaintiffs in the Truchon case were people with disabilities. So you really, it's, it's very evident that that's what's going on is you're just trying to relitigate a case that was lost through an argument about a delay on access for people with mental disorders, which I think is, is, is unconscionable to do that. And it's, well, it's very evident they were doing it because what happened is right away after that vote happened in the Senate yesterday, a press release was sent out about, okay, now we've got this, now let's roll back track two. Let's, yeah. let's take away made for people with disabilities. Well, and, and look, the, the major opposition uh, party has made it clear that this is not a concept or an idea they embrace, although there's lots of individuals amongst them that do, but in terms of political decision making. So it's kind of doubly um, uh, troubling on the part of the government that knowing that, knowing that elections happen, that, that polls are, are saying that that might be a likely outcome. Again, it seemed kind of a political decision. We'll put this down the road, and if and if those other guys get elected, well, then they'll take the heat uh, for rolling it back. But but I think the the government has not had the courage of its convictions on this one. They're the ones that said we are going to put we are going to do something about this, and proposed it, and then have now spent all of their time rolling it back. Yeah. And what's bizarre too, think about it. Last year they came and said they needed a year. Yeah. Now you need three. Wait a minute. You were, you were either within a year. Yeah. In which case it makes no sense to say you need three now, or you weren't within a year last year. So it, it, it just is in, incoherent. And unfortunately, I think that they've not only have they made a political calculation, I think they've made a poor one, because what's clear is this is not going to kick the can down three years past the election. This is going to be in everybody's face through this election campaign. Yeah, yeah, they, it, it was a, a poor judgment call on that issue, too. But it really does. I mean, this is something you've spent your professional life on. Um, I come to this from a very different point of view, personal family history that brought me to this issue um, mm -hmm. as, as a senator, for sure. Um, but I do really feel that now the whole, the, the backstory on this, that, that mental illness, if you will, was just the Trojan horse uh, into which we were having uh, an, the intent to roll back made totally. Yeah. It's, it's very clear from the record that that's what's been going on. And so it's very disturbing to think what's coming in the coming months and years, um, because we know, we know what it is. It's going to be a, a an absolute attack on access to MAID, um, quite outside the realm of people with mental disorders as their sole underlying condition. And it, and it's, I guess the, the question is that always troubles me is that this government itself says and is so committed to the concept of choice on so many other fronts, choice in the abortion debate. Nobody wants to force it on you, but if you should have a choice, a choice on the question of gender, uh, make those calls yourself in your lifestyle calls and keep government out of it, right? Those are personal calls. But then choice on this, which... 85% of the population agrees with is somehow no longer eligible to be a matter where choice should be considered. Yeah, I, I think this debate has for me surfaced a deep stigma and bias against persons with mental disorders that I thought we were somewhat yeah. past. I knew we weren't totally past it. Of course, there's still discrimination and stigma and bias, but it's deep. And that's what came through in this is that people feel it is acceptable to um, remove choice from this one group. They're the only group who, that, that don't have choice to ha build into their comments about why they're doing this suggestion that people with mental disorders lack decision-making capacity. They're more vulnerable to lacking decision-making capacity than people without mental disorders, that kind of thing. That's been, that's been probably the most depressing disturbing yeah. aspect of this is to see it peeled back and to recognize the level of stigma and bias that remains in our, in our society against people with mental disorders. As you say, it's, choice is, ch is ch championed for everyone except people with mental disorders. Yeah. 
No, and and, it, and it, again, the the issue is you well know we've discussed it before the the whole question of advance requests, which is really my issue. Um, but but the reason I was brought into this debate and drawn into this debate is because I see the same things reflected that if you have a diagnosis of of Alzheimer's, even though you may be perfectly of sound mind for five or seven or 10 years, that somehow you can't make a decision about that, that you've lost your capability to do it. And, and you know, that's on the edges of this too, which is it really undermines that question, which is again, what Canadian public says over and over again, we would like to be able to make those choices ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think what we have to do reasonably, and they, they set this out that it's about choice and safety. Right? Yeah. And nobody who is advocating for the delay not to be granted denies the need for safety. We all embrace that. And we embrace that in the context of advanced requests. We will have to be very careful to ensure that it is done so that we know people are safe. But but you can do it safely. We know you can do it safely. The courts have been telling us that for years. The regulators of clinicians have been telling us that. We we know we can do it safely. We just need to do it. Um, and not to say, oh, it's complicated and maybe it will be risky. And so therefore we're just going to not allow anybody to have it. That That's not a sufficient justification for keeping it from people. So we, we need to embrace that the, the uh, fact that choice and safety can live together in absolute harmony in our system. They do now mm -hmm. and they can, they can in the future. Well, you we know better than, than most that, I mean, no, the, the doctors are extremely, the medical professionals are extremely cautious on this issue. It is a matter still ruled under the criminal code. They could lose their livelihoods. They could go to prison. Nobody does this in the blink of an eye. Nobody says, come on down. Uh, you know, you can have access to this. It's a very rigorous process, at least those that I have witnessed most certainly are. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'd add to your, they don't want to breach the criminal code because they face criminal liability. Yeah. They don't want to breach their practice standards because they don't want to lose their licenses. And often clinicians are actually more afraid of their, their colleges and they are the, the criminal yeah. codes. They're much more likely to get in trouble with them. But the third thing I'd throw in there is, their own moral compass. Yeah. They don't want to breach their own moral compass because they are doing this out of respect for people's autonomy and, in an, and, and with deep commitment to every people being safe. And so they don't want to be doing this in a careless, haphazard, trivial way because that would breach their own conscience. And I think people need to recognize the, the incredibly conscientious way that providers in Canada operate with respect to made it is it is deep, and um, we need to we need to recognize that the flip of this is not the flip. It's not the opposite. It's just further evidence of this fact it, that we don't have non-compliance. Is we don't have evidence of non-compliance, right. and we have oversight. People so they were suggesting that there isn't sufficient oversight in Canada. That was one of the arguments that got trotted out, and yet the ninety two over ninety two percent of made deaths in Canada are actually subject to, to additional oversight, not just the federal, everything gets the federal oversight. And then 92% because of where it happens, it's BC, Ontario, Quebec, and so where so the very highly populated already have an additional layer of oversight. So again, we, we don't have evidence of non-compliance with the rules. What we have are anecdotes. Yeah. They are anecdotes often from people who are removed from the situation. They maybe are estranged family members and so on. So they don't actually have the full medical record and the yeah. clinicians can't disclose to the public. They can, of course, disclose to the colleges and to the police when if, if a complaint is made. And there's just there isn't the evidence of noncompliance. Yeah. These st stories that have come up that, you know, if you're poor or hungry, you can just simply walk into a, a doctor's office and they will do it. I mean, it's it's absolute nonsense because it's not how the process works. Right. It just isn't. I mean, you have to be assessed and there's, and, and also I guess just on that and, and perhaps sadly, the statistics show that most people who, who access made, who choose this are well to do, um, you know, white, wealthy access to healthcare system. It's, it's not the others who, 
who really have easy access on that. Yeah, yeah, the evidence is strong that socioeconomic vulnerability does not uh, lead yeah. to increased rates of medical assistance in dying. Yeah. One of the things that was considered in this debate by, by my colleague, Senator Kutcher, and, and in the end, just because of the politics of the place, he he decided not to proceed, but he wanted to suggest that perhaps individuals dealing with mental health issues should be allowed during this process of reconsideration to go and plead their own individual case, to be able to go to a court and say, I know your concerns and I hear you that you want to wait until there's enough, but here's my case, please consider it. Um, would that have been something that is workable? You've got experience being on the court side of these issues. Yeah, absolutely workable. Um, I think the government should have included a provision for exemption orders. That's what it would be called. Uh, and with them not including it, I think the Senate should have insisted upon an amendment that introduced it. Because what this does is it enables someone not to argue the constitutionality of right. made for mental disorders, but rather you just, you go to court and you say, the clinician goes to court and says, this person has been assessed by two independent assessors. They've been found to meet all the eligibility criteria and the procedural safeguards, but for the exclusion and get a judicial authorization to proceed with MAID. And the reason this is so appropriate here is because we have a direct analogy to draw on. What happened when the Carter case came through in Canada and it struck down the ban on assisted dying, it gave the parliament time to put in place a legislative framework. But then Parliament took too long. So they went back and they said, okay, our deadline's, you know, our deadline's gone. Can we have some more time? And the court said, yes, you can have more time, but, but people must be able to go to court and show that if they meet the eligibility criteria that we set out in Carter, they can have access to MAID. And that happened. And so the courts know how to do this. And we had those cases. We did it again with the Truchon case, which was yeah. a case in Quebec that said it struck down the eligibility criterion of natural death has become reasonably foreseeable, said, no, nope, that's not OK. It again gave Parliament time to fix the law. And then again, Parliament didn't meet its deadline. So it came back and asked, this should all be echoing of what happened in, exactly. in Parliament, right? with this, is to say, we don't have time. OK, we'll give you more time. But in the meantime, individuals have to be able to go to court and get a remedy. So there's a clear process. A number of people did that. It's safe. Clinicians know how to do it. Lawyers know how to do it. The judges know how to do it. And now what you could say is at first people would ask me, well, can't you just go and do that under Carter or under Truchon right now? And the problem is, no, you can't because those cases are finished. They're, yeah. you know, we had the bill C-14 or C-7. So we don't yeah. have a process there, but parliament can do it. They've got it in the criminal code already for something else. So it's it's there. We have precedent. And, and the thing I would emphasize here is if you think about it, the Supreme Court gave this path, this alternate path while Parliament was taking too long after 12 months. Yeah. Trushan yep. gave it after six months. They started giving, the, we're talking, we're done three years already. Yeah. And now another. And now we're looking at six. So I could, I would say no court would ever say, okay, we're going to do a year to get yourself ready. And now you can just have delay upon delay upon delay for six years without creating a process whereby someone could go to court. That's what I think makes this bill so unconstitutional because yeah. there was a way to minimize the harm, give people the path. It's not a great, it's not a great path. It costs money, takes time, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. But it's not a, it's not a complete roadblock in front of you, which is what people are facing now. You know, it, it, it's so sad. And, and I think many of us thought this at the time, which is the Supreme Court basically said, here, here is a path. And then when governments start to get involved and try to micromanage everything and say what day and how many and whom and this and that, it becomes so complicated um, that it creates new exclusions and builds higher walls. I, I don't mean about safety and access. We need all of the walls in the world for that. I just mean in general, they said this is okay. So why don't we just proceed and let doctors and, and patients 
have these discussions like we do on every other issue. If I've got stage four cancer, I go to my doctor and we talk about what the options are and what I should do. And I take his or her advice and talk to my family. Like this is ultimately a personal decision, so personal in the end anyway. Yeah, and, and what we have seen is an extraordinary bleeding over from the federal jurisdiction, which is the criminal code, into right. the delivery of health care, which is provincial territorial. And one of the startling things about that provincial territorial letter from these various ministers saying we're not ready is, when do you ever see yeah. provincial ministers writing yeah. to the federal government and saying, please interfere in our, <laughs> in our area of jurisdiction, please, right. please weigh in on this, they don't. And so, you know, what's happened is a lot of what's been done, even just in the readiness that was done last year, is unheard of for the federal government to be getting involved in. The, you know, we developed model practice standards. That's not just outside the federal government's jurisdiction. It's not even, it's, it's delegated from the provincial governments to yeah. regulatory bodies. So we're over trying to draft practice standards for colleges, physicians and surgeons and colleges of nurses to adopt is so far removed from yeah. the proper jurisdiction and area of, act, of activity by the federal government. Um, well, that's the thing. I mean, no, do you you never hear a province say, please come and interfere in my jurisdiction? Yeah. And you never yeah. hear the federal government say, I want unanimity of all the provinces before I impose my new policy. Never happened. Never happened, which is why you have provinces opting out of everything, daycare yeah. and carbon taxes and you name it, because it's not Ottawa's business. <laughs> it's just yeah, and and the notion of of readiness, all the provinces having to be ready, so we have consistency across the country. That was that was quite shocking too, because yeah. you're now letting provinces that have deliberately dragged their feet, right. which we have right. some, yeah. hold hostage the people in the provinces that didn't that got the hard work done. So, for yeah. instance, Nova Scotia, we our MAID program is ready. They've hired the psychiatrist. We're so ready. And so people in Nova Scotia are being prevented from having access because Manitoba and maybe New Brunswick didn't, you yeah. know, didn't want to get no, ready. No, it, it, consistency, that's, we, ne we, ne we have no consistency whatsoever in healthcare and that's not a reason. No, uh, I mean, on any issue, on no. any health related issue, we have no consistency. Do you think, and I, I will, we'll end on this part of the kind of the next steps that, hmm. you know, a law or a right for one should apply to all. I mean, we all have freedoms, but if we break the law, we go to jail or, you know, there's restrictions on those freedoms. But mm -hmm. can you really have a law that applies to all Canadians and then say, accept you and accept you and accept you? Will this not inevitably have to end up in the court if somebody can afford to take it there? I will tell you that while I was watching the speeches in the yeah. Senate, I was getting emails from people saying, OK, um, we, we, we have to go to court um, yeah. from individuals who wanted to take it to court not just i i would have expected it from lawyers saying okay now we have to go to court we were getting emails from people who are the ones who are going to face this three-year delay now who've been waiting three years who are saying i Enough. can't wait another three years and so absolutely this is going to end up in court it's going to end up in court in pretty short order i think um we've got lawyers already gearing up and um and, you know, it, it's really, really sad that the way we make progress in the context of medical assistance and dying Canada keeps being on the backs of the individuals who yeah. have to carry the burden of litigation, which is horrible. Even if, you know, the lawyers make the arguments and other people raise the money, you're still there. And now we're going to expect people with mental disorders to have to come into court and disclose all of the circumstances of their lives, yeah. the things they've tried and they've not. And because parliament will never do the right thing, the courts just keep having to push them to it. And so we've had Carter, we had Truchon, and now we're going to have Jane yeah. and John Doe have to do this yet again. Yeah. No, it's very sad. And I know I've spoken to people about this uh, uh, in the legal profession on the whole question of advanced requests. Is that the way to go to kind of take it to the Supreme Court and get a ruling? Because it seems to be the only thing that forces governments to do anything. But this is like a 
million dollar, multi-million dollar process. Uh, so literally, and unless you win the lottery, it, it's kind of hard to go that route. Yeah, there's, you know, there's another charter case we're doing at the moment with respect to MAID, and we had to line up $250,000 in advance, assuming free lawyers. Yeah. Assuming we're going to, that's just for the outside costs associated with it. So it is incredibly expensive to go to court. On your, on your advance request piece, the, the advantage that you have in the context of moving it forward through a parliamentary process is the is two things. One is the level of support yep. uh, for it. It's just so high. There's barely anything that Canadians and agree on. Yeah. 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 As is that. And the other is that it is an issue that um is not limited to people who are historically disadvantaged and stigmatized yeah. and discriminated against. So it is a more powerful group who will be able to uh, mobilize and and advocate for it than we have in the context of people with mental disorders as their sole underlying condition. Yeah. And just the the little context for that, that that it did the the idea of advance requests was approved by the Senate. Uh, and it was the federal government that said, no, we're, we're not going to do advanced requests. We're going to do uh, mental illness as a sole underlying cause. It was their choice. Uh, and they took that one. And and now, as we know, they've they've done a 180 on that. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not optimistic about the other, but my legislation sits in front of a committee and we'll hope somebody looks at it soon. <laughs> we all just have to keep trying. I have the button, nevertheless, she persisted on the <laughs> board, and that's all we can do. We just yeah. keep we just keep trying. And you know, we took us a long time to get Carter. Yep, um, absolutely. But we got there. And so we just keep trying. Well, and I just I want to say thank you as as somebody who has thrown herself into this issue to have uh professionals such as yourself with the the perspective, not only of the law, but of bioethics that, you know, you've, re this is a hugely complicated issue. Uh, and I, I don't expect those with a moral or religious uh, view on this to change their mind. I'm not asking them to. Uh, I just wanted to come back to this simple question of choice and, and you keep fighting the fight. And so thank you very much for all that you do. Well, thank you for what you've been doing in the Senate too. You've tried valiantly. Probably. We'll probably see you soon, I guess. Yes. How Absolutely. Will that? Absolutely. <laughs> Jocelyn Downey, uh, Chair in Public Policy and Law at the Schulich School, um, has worked on these cases, as you've heard, for many, many years. And uh, she is an expert in end-of-life law, policy and care. And, and thank you for being so. We will talk soon and thank you all for joining us today uh, for this discussion of where we stand with medical assistance in dying legislation. That's it for this edition of No Nonsense. We'll see you soon.